え皆さんこんばんは。Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. A two-day event, SDGs Global Festival of Action from Japan, has been held since yesterday, March 25. This workshop, going for the global with go,、uh, going for the gold with the global gold, vote for refugees, is hosted by the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, and is a part of the event. I am Yasuko Miyajima, and I am a cultural sports journalist. I will serve as moderator for today's workshop. Miyajima Yasuko, I'm a sports culture journalist. So, I, this is a globally broadcast workshop, so I will do my best to moderate in English. And I'm getting a bit nervous, but I will do my best. And thank you in advance for your patience. At the bottom of the screen, you will find an interpretation button with which you may select English or Or Japanese. Please make use of the button. For more than 40 years, I have covered the Olympics and the Paralympics. Also, I have reported and produced stories about sports for people with disabilities and sports for refugees at a broadcaster, TV Asahi in Japan. English is not my first language, but I will try to do my best. Today, we will discuss on strengthening the transformative power of sport for people forcibly displaced from home because of conflict, violence, or persecution. For children and youth uprooted by war, Or persecution. Sport is much more than a leisure activity. It's an opportunity to be included and protected, a chance to heal, develop, and grow. Sport can also be a positive encouragement for empowering refugee communities, helping to strengthen social unity and forge closer ties. With host communities. I have been very fortunate to be able to meet and interview many refugee athletes throughout my career. For a female athlete who had been suffered from a lack of freedom, doing sport was to learn to be independent. For a male athlete who lost his family and hoped to be strong, the sport was his hope to live. From them, I have been able to learn the power of sport. For them, sport is not just a leisure activity, it means more for them. 私は難民や障害を持った人のスポーツの特集を。私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、私は、Sport is also recognized as an important supporter of sustainable development. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development notes the growing contribution of sport to the realization of development and peace in its promotion of tolerance and respect and the contributions it makes to the empowerment of women and young people. Individuals and communities, as well as to health, education, 
and social inclusion objectives. For the first 30 to 40 minutes, we will hear from our panel and then onto the floor to Q&A. Now we have with us today four panelists. Can I ask each panelist to quickly introduce themselves by saying their name, title, and organization? In order of Megumi, Keith, Nianen, Andrew, please. Uh, thank you, Miyajima-san. Minasan, uh, konbanwa. Um, it's such a pleasure to be on this panel today. Uh, my name is Megumi Aoyama, and I work for the sport coordination team at UNHCR headquarters, um, where we work on sport partnership as well as sport programs, really looking at ways to leverage sport as a tool to bring better outcomes for the communities we serve. I'm very much looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you. And next, Kes. Yes, my name is Kes Aguer Bull. I'm a South Sudanese refugee. I'm working as youth sport facilitator in Kakumba Refugees Camp. Thank you. And your name? Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nyanen Malik, a refugee from South Sudan, mm -hmm. and I'm working as a youth sport facilitator in Kakumba Refugee Camp. Thank you. Thank you. In person. Hi, my name is Andrew Parsons. I'm the president of the International Paralympic Committee. I have been involved with sports for persons with disability for the last 24 years. And I'm really looking forward to discussing with you on this panel and mainly to talk to you a little bit about our refugee Paralympic team that is going to participate in Tokyo mm -hmm. 2020. Thank you. What a nice panelist we have today. I'm sure we can realize the power of sport together. For the next hour, we hope you all will listen to the discussion and leave today motivated to support people forced to flee and leave feeling empowered to take action on the SDGs. Together, we can realize a world where no one is left behind. Let us now welcome our first speaker of the day. She has been working together with me. Our first speaker today is Miss Aoyama, External Relations Officer, UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency. Miss Aoyama and I used to work together at the broadcaster, so I am so happy to work with her again today. So, Ms. Aoyama, please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you, uh, Miyajima-san, and of course, it's an honor to, to, work, to be able to work with you again. Um, today, I'm very excited to be able to share how UNHCR works in partnerships to leverage the power of sports for the communities we serve. Um, and as you may know, the UN Refugee Agency is the leading organization dedicated to saving lives protecting rights and building better futures for the approximately 80 million people who are forced to flee because of conflict, violence, violence, and persecution. And I wanted to start out from laying out, so what are some of the key needs and challenges that we are facing as an organization? Well, if we look at the challenges at the field level, more than half of refugees are children under the age of 18. And despite the huge gains that has been made in refugee enrollment and retention in the formal education system, we are still seeing an estimated 48% of refugees that are not able to attend school. And as a result, they experience challenges in accessing life opportunities. Also to note, uh, restrictive policies at the national level in many states mean that young people do not have access to training and employment opportunities in line with host community young people, uh, leaving refugees oftentimes with uncertain futures. Now, if we pull back and look at the situation from a broader global perspective, we are seeing that unfortunately, increasingly, uh, narratives around refugees and asylum issues have become quite toxic 
And there's really a greater need than ever to build support for refugees with states governments, but also with the global and general public. Now, to address these challenges and respond to these needs, a UNHCR cannot and do not uh, do this alone. And this is why SDG 17, uh, Partnerships for the Goals, is critical in advancing our mandate. Now, you might know the Global Compact on Refugees, uh, which was affirmed in 2018, really captures this idea and highlights this as the whole of society approach. So this is about encouraging UNHCR to work together with diverse range of stakeholders in society, not just the traditional humanitarian organizations actors, but also with development actors, uh, private sector, non-traditional actors, such as the sport community and sport actors uh, to engage in and support the refugee response. Um, it has been very exciting that in 2019, 87 organizations pledged to use the power of sport to build a better world for refugees uh, during the first global pledging conference, you might know as the Global Refugee Forum, on which UNHCR and partners organized to operationalize this global compact. Um, organizations that pledged include international sport organizations, international federations, uh, national committees, associations, professional and grassroots sport clubs, foundations, all committing to work together to increase sporting opportunities for refugees at all levels. So today I wanted to share a few examples of how the sport world has been indeed making this commitment into reality and helping us achieve our mandate and partnership. So one area is around programs, sport programs. And we have been working in close partnership with the Olympic Refuge Foundation uh, together implementing organized sport programs in displaced settings um, in locations such as Rwanda, DRC, uh, Kenya Kakuma, where we have speakers today from uh, Mexico and Colombia. And these organized uh, sports for protection programs, as we call, have really been influential in creating this uh, safe, fun, supportive environment for displaced youth and children to be able to come together, uh, feel safe and protected, to be included in their teams and their communities, um, and also have access to various uh, capacity development opportunities, which are contributing to SDG 3 and 16, enhancing both physical and mental well being, but also protecting displaced youth and children from risks such as abuse, uh, exploitation, and violence. The second area is around skills development and enhancing career opportunities. So along with partners, the Squirt Foundation and the Football Club Social Alliance, which is an alliance of six European football clubs, uh, we have worked together to educate and train refugee youth to become young coaches who then organize sport activities for children in their community. And it has been very impactful because indeed it gives refugee youth the opportunity to formalize their skills um, based off of that, earn an income and become leaders and role models in their community which contributes to SDG 4 and 8, so helping build the skills and capacities and improve employment opportunities for displaced young people. The third area I wanted to highlight our partnership is in the area of advocacy and sports diplomacy. And for this, um, one of the partners that we work with is the International Sport and Cultural Association. And what we try to do is to mobilize a network of more than 70 organizations in Europe working towards integration of refugees through grassroots sports. What we are advocating together for is refugee access to sport facilities, a community clubs, broader opportunities in communities, and also to change the narrative, um, break down stereotypes or barriers to really try to facilitate the inclusion and integration of refugees through the platform that sport provides. Um, and we believe that this is um, targeting the achievement towards SDG 10 and 11, uh, promoting policies to ensure equal opportunity, a social economic and political inclusion, as well as ensuring access for all to basic services. Now, lastly, I would like to highlight our partnership with the International Olympic Committee and the International Paralympic Committee. And among the many activities that we do together, we are very excited to be supporting the IOC and the IPC in bringing the refugee Olympic team and the Paralympic team to compete and participate in the Tokyo Games this summer, which I'm sure Andrew will be speaking a lot more to. 
but we really hope through this initiative that we can showcase the resilience and hope that refugee athletes embodies and really send out this strong message to call for a world in which all displaced people with or without disabilities can equally access the benefits of sport. And this of course significantly contributes to all the SDGs that I highlighted earlier on promoting health, um, enhancing learning and skills development opportunities, promoting equal access and inclusion, fostering a more peaceful world without violence um, where refugees are able to thrive, not just survive and no one is left behind. So on that note, I would like to present a very special video, a message from Perbiel, uh, who is an IOC refugee scholarship holder, a UNHCR Goodwill ambassador, and currently training very hard in hopes of becoming part of the IOC refugee Olympic team for Tokyo 2020. I I'm poor. I'm training. I'm running. Running saved my life. When I was a boy, I lost everything. My family, my home. With a soldier behind me, I ran from the sound of war. I ran for survival. Now I'm safe from war. There's a mighty team behind me. Now I run toward my dreams. I ran to the sound of Shari. My name is Paul. I am a refugee. I am an athlete. I am an Olympian. Uh, what a nice video. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Oyama, for your great presentation. And what a nice video. Uh, I was very, very impressed. Uh, Mr. Beard's story and his quote. I ran toward my dreams, but I ran from the sound of war. Now I run toward my dreams. It's so powerful. And running saved my life. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you for showing such a nice video. Now, let me introduce our next panelist. Miss Kes Aguabul is a 24 years old South Sudanese refugee who is a supervisor, youth sport facilitator for Jesuit worldwide. And Nyanen Yuhimalik is a former secondary school teacher and now youth sports facilitator. UNHCR Jesuit Worldwide. Youth sports facilitators undergo a certificate course in Kakuma Refugee Camp, Kenya, certified by a university in USA to train youth and primary school teachers as certified sport for protection facilitators. After completion of the course, youth and primary school teachers who at the time will be certified sport for protection facilitators will implement sporting activities and farm-based physical exercise in primary school settings by using sports as an in incentive for out-of-school refugee children to enroll or re-enroll into primary school and to retain those children who are at the risk of dropping out. Keith, please tell us about your work as a Jesuit Worldwide Learning UNHCR Youth Sports Facilitator. What does that require? Keith? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, as I use sport facilitator, I help with a training 20 youth and primary school teachers in Kakuma refugee camp. Mm -hmm. 
For example, I help a small group discussion uh, in uh, for this one for the complete assignment. I also help them to understand what they have not understand when they are reading the reading materials. I also help them about how to lock in or the context of the use sport facilitator. So that is it. And then also, as I, I, I myself participate in youth sport facilitator, I help youth sport youth who are in the community to understand how sport facilitator is, is important to them. So I do help them and uh, I, I told them that this use for facilitator, it is good and it can help you to come up with the talent what you have. Also, last, this course started last year in October. The use for facilitator started last year in October. Also, I decided to become a youth sport facilitator because I wanted to help the other people who are in the community. Because youth is this for protection. It protects children and youth who are in the community. So I also decided that. Also, youth sport facilitator, I really enjoy because I interact with the other, the other people and share the ideas which they have and what I have to them, both of them. And this youth sport facilitator course, it is offline and online course. It is both. So that's Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Nyanem, why do you think sport is important for refugees, in particular for young women and girls? Nyanem? Yes, I'm getting you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, once again, I'm Nyanen. And to answer the question that I've just been asked, let's uh, take, uh, especially in the refugee camp, that is the setting that we are in, sport do act as a tool for protection and peace building. Through sporting activities, people from different backgrounds and different ethnicities, different cultures are brought together sport do bring them together. Here in the camp, people have different backgrounds, ethnicities and cultures that they are following. So this help them come together and do something constructive, do something that is helping them, do something that will unite them together. Mostly in the camp, people are not much involved in coming together and do something good, mainly because their cultures are different, their backgrounds and their religions are different. And mostly they, are, they do engage themselves in fighting. So these sport activities help them come together. Let's take an example, like we are in the same team with someone and then we are engaged in a fight. I will, fear, I will have the fear of losing that or hurting the, the person, mainly because if I hurt the person who will, be, who will help me in, in my team, that is, I will, when it comes to game, I will lose, definitely I will lose the game. So I'll fear, I'll have that fear of losing my teammate or losing my neighbor, losing someone whom we do play together in the same team. Uh, uh, another one that sport do bring together, let's say that sport is a huge empowerment for women and girls that are in the Kakuma refugee setting. It promotes health, it promotes physical fitness and mental well-being for the girls. Let's take an example of young girls are mostly excluded in sporting activities, mainly because the mindset that we have, or let's say that the mindset that people have, it's like sports are only meant for men and boys. So girls are not included. And they are also terms as weak, vulnerable and incapable of doing anything. The only thing that our people do put in mind is that girls are, should only stay at home. They should only do the house skills that, uh, uh, that, that the mentality of our cultures or our background 
put the community to be. And if they are given an opportunity to prove that they are capable, let's take an example of Kath. Kath went through this course and she formed a team that is a volleyball team for all girls. They participated and they were winning against other teams. So this opened the mindset of the people in the community mm -hmm. that girls can do it. Girls are capable of doing that. Girls can do what other people or what boys and men can do. And that will take me to the saying that says, what a man can do, a woman can do better. Because mm -hmm. the volleyball teams of Kath brought that picture that girls are also capable of doing it. Okay, in uh, let's say that in this, uh, the, the team that Kath formed broke the stereotype that we have. That is the one-sided story that we have that girls are only, should only stay at home or they should not participate in the activities that men's, men do. Okay, there's only one thing that is really impressing me, like it's really depressing me actually. I have a lot of stress about it because we don't have the role models that will will act in our community that will show the community that we girls are capable of doing this. It's only Kate and let's say that I can be one of the role models, but we are only two and we cannot uh, like manage the whole Kakuma refugee camp with a lot of people in it. So if the role models are increased mm -hmm. and awareness is put in place that girls can do it, the community mindset will be open and actually everything will be good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Keith and Nianem. You spoke about volleyball. It's wonderful. Let me talk a little bit about volleyball. Uh, I would like to mention a little bit about the volleyball. Uh, 14 years ago, I went to Damak refugee camp in Nepal with the Olympic gold medalist of volleyball. Volleyball is an only ball game that a player shouldn't drop a ball to the ground. So how to continue rally is important when you play volleyball. Because of that, when a player passes a ball to another player, a player think about another player. By doing that, player can learn how to care and trust others. The importance of cooperation and feel the unity as a team. Volleyball just unites people. This is a great sport to unite and for that process. And one more thing I wanted to mention about the power of sports. Let me introduce another story of an athlete. Her name is Huriba Reda E. She participated in the judo of the 2004 Athens Olympics as the first female Olympian from Afghanistan. She was persecuted after her return to Afghanistan because she did not cover her head with a hijab when she played a match. She was told that she embarrassed Afghan women and received death threats. She later became a refugee and now lives in Canada and she supports the women who continue to do judo in Afghanistan now. About doing judo, she said, by controlling my body with my own will, we learn to be independent. She asserted that in a country where women are harassed, sports can help women become more independent. By controlling my body with my own will, we learn to be independent. It's a very nice expression. By controlling my body with my own will, we learn to be independent. That's what she said. It's a very nice expression.
Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Andrew Parsons from Brazil. Uh, Mr. Andrew Parsons is the global president of the International Paralympic Committee. Mr. Person, please feel free to start. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I really would like to, to thank UNHCR for the opportunity to be speaking here. This uh, my morning to you, your evening in Japan. <laughs> um, first of all, just like to say that Nianen and Kat, you are absolute rock stars. I really enjoy listening to you. And the first thing I will tell my 11-year-old daughter when I see her, again, because she's at school, is Whatever a man can do, a woman can do better. So thanks for that. Thanks for that. But uh, what, what I would like to share with you this, um, during this session here is about three groups of people. A group of 1 billion, a group of 80 million people, and a group of six individuals. Let's start by the group of 1 billion people. There are 1 billion persons with disability in the world. So 15% of the global population is made of persons with disability. And that's why we have the Paralympic movement. The Paralympic movement is not only about the games, the games are the third largest sport event in the world after the Olympics and the FIFA World Cup. But the Paralympic movement is a platform. It's a platform to put light to the fact exactly that there are 1 billion persons with disability in the world. And they are probably the most marginalized group uh, in the world. So when, we, when you have athletes competing, inspiring the world, inspiring people, spectators on the stands, uh, inspiring people who are watching the Paralympics on TV or, or in the internet, uh, there is a change in the way people perceive persons with disability. And why it's so powerful is because of the vehicle. And the vehicle is a sport. So it's not like I'm doing now that I'm preaching to you, I'm telling you things. No, it's by the person's own experience with what she's, she or he is seeing. So with the, uh, an amputee athlete uh, running 100 meters in 11 seconds, it's on the winter side when you have blind people, blind skiers going downhill at 100 kilometers per hour. So there is a change in the mindset of people. And when you start to change the mindset is when you start to change reality. You can't change reality without changing how people see um, something, in this case, the population of persons with disabilities. So the, the Paralympic Games are first about the athletes and, and, and they are a platform for change. But what do we do in between games? No, the games are every two years, uh, winter and summer. If we talk about the summer games, it's only about uh, every four years. So everything that we do when it comes to campaigns and supporting our national Paralympic committees in their programs from grassroots to elite, what we want is really to change the world using sport. We believe the sport is the most powerful tool of promoting inclusion, of promoting health, promoting citizenship, of promoting positive values. So speaking about positive values, I think this brings us to the second group I have mentioned, 80 million people. As you know, there are over 80 million displaced people around the world right now, 30, uh, 30 million of whom are refugees. We have signed a commitment with the UNHCR uh, in 2019 at the Refugee Forum uh, when we promised to promote uh, the access to sport facilities, organized sport, and equal participation of sport events for refugees. That is when the idea of creating the, the refugee team started. And there are many reasons why this is important to us. Of course, we deal with marginalized people. We understand that refugees are also marginalized a population. But there is one thing you don't know. The father of the Paralympic movement, the founder of the Paralympic movement, Sir Ludwig Gutmann, was a refugee. He fled from a uh, uh, German Nazi, the Nazi, the then Nazi German. He was a Jewish doctor, and he went to England. In um, and there, he started to work in the Stoke Mandeville Rehabilitation Center. And he was the man who created the concept of introducing sports as a way of rehabilitation. And then he created the Stoke Mandeville International Games. And then he created in 1960 
the Paralympic Games in Rome. So he is the founder and the father of, of our movement, and he was a refugee. And when you hear uh, some of his comments uh, recorded in video, some of the, his writings, you understand uh, what being a refugee has given to him in terms of change, in putting his work to the service of something uh, bigger than himself. That's when he started the Paralympic movement. That, and he was a, just a clever and a visionary man. And he said something that to me, as president of the APC resonates strongly these days. It's, he said, my dream is that in the future, every disabled person in the world becomes a taxpayer. Mm. Because it means citizenship, because it means, it, means, it means having a job, having, being productive to society, mm. contributing to society. So that's, that's his vision. To the, to the persons with disability at the world, at the global level, and it is our vision for them, but it's our vision also to the refugees. Mm -hmm. We want you to be citizens. And I think this brings us to the final group of people, the six individuals. And this is the IPC refugee team that is going to compete in Tokyo. And I would like to give you, uh, to talk a little bit about one, one particular athlete, because he was a member of the refugee team we had in Rio 2016. His name is Ibrahim Al Hussein, and he comes from Syria. So he had a normal childhood in Syria. By the age of five, he was swimming, and swimming was his passion. But then the war came in Syria, and everything changed. One day in 2012, Ibrahim and two friends, they got a call. They had another friend who got injured in fighting. So the three went to rescue him. But then when they were trying to to save or to rescue uh, their friends, a tank shell exploded near them and Ibrahim lost his lower right leg. His treatment was done by a dentist because there were no doctors who could look after Ibrahim at the time. Then he decided to move to, from Syria because uh, as an amputee in a wheelchair at the time, uh, he was looking for better conditions. He thought Syria was not the place to, 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 to live in his condition. So in 2014, he embarked in a very dangerous journey from Syria to Europe, and he traveled through Turkey with smugglers helping him to get to the Greek islands, and then eventually he got to, to Athens, knowing no one. Of course, he could not speak the language. He spent the first 18 days living in the mountains outside of Athens, but then something just incredible happened. Uh, he bumped into this man who amazingly spoke Arabic, to Ibrahim and then, and then they had a conversation. And the man explained to Ibrahim that he had a friend who, used, who at the time was using a prosthetics. Then he introduced this guy to, to Ibrahim and, Ibrahim and then this guy introduced his doctor to Ibrahim and the doctor gave Ibrahim a prosthetic. And this was a truly really life changing because you know, with assistive tech technology, as we call it, Ibrahim could walk freely. And then he got a job. And as he got a job, he was able to pay the rent. As, as he paid the rent, he was able to have a home. And home, as you know, and Nianen and Kat, I think you can agree with Ibrahim, uh, home in some way means security. If you have a home, you would like to feel this feeling of security. And Ibrahim felt that. Uh, and then he decided to, to, to engage in sport once again. And then as swimming was his passion, he, look, he was looking for a pool in Athens and he came across the legacy of the Athens 2004 games, which is the Olympic and Paralympic, uh, uh, Olympic and Paralympic pool. And then he started to train. The National Paralympic Committee of Greece uh, noticed him uh, and started to offer him the training to get Ibrahim to his next level of development as an athlete. And then the NPC of Greece uh, informed us about it. And this was the inspiration for the refugee Paralympic team at Rio 2016 Games. Ibrahim was one of the two athletes. He competed in the 50 meters event and then 100 meters event. And this morning, so a few hours ago, he spoke to our team in our, at our headquarters as well, remotely in Germany. But it's always good to put our employees in contact with athletes to remember why we do the things we do. And one of the things that Ibrahim said is that this time he wants to win a medal, not only to participate. Uh, I wish 
he qualifies to the games and I wish the, all the best to him as an athlete. But what I want to tell to the people who are watching us this, uh, this, this evening or morning or afternoon is when you see Ibrahim competing at the Tokyo 2020 Paralympics, you know, cheer for him and all the other five rep members of the refugee athlete team. Uh, these athletes, they are not in invisible. They are, in they are human beings. So it's more than six, more than 80 million, more than one billion. These people are not numbers. So they, and when we come to persons with disability and refugees with disabilities, they are the excluded of the excluded. People are not just numbers and we have to remind that. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Thank you, Mr. Persons. I could understand the importance of the inclusion of refugee to Paralympic Games. And this is the first time to know that uh, Rudrich Gut uh, Gutmann, uh, the father of the Paralympic movement, he was a refugee. Uh, this is first time to know that. And the father of the Paralympic movement, the Rudrich Gutmann, uh, focused an in individual's mind on what they can do rather than regretting what they can no longer do. Through sport, Goodman gave that person back the will to live to full life with pride and self-respect. Dr. Ludwig Gutmann, who was known as the father of the Paralympic movement, it was my first time to learn that he also was a refugee, and he always said that we should count what we have, not count what we no longer can do. And through, through sport, he taught individuals the will to live a full life. And this quote, count what one can do rather than what one can no longer do. And this quote feels very relevant in this era of the coronavirus crisis. Now, I would like to invite questions from the audience for panelists. Hmm. Uh, for Nianen, Keith, Megumi, and Andrew, uh, all of them. Mm. Why is it important for refugee children uh, with and without disabilities to have opportunity to play and do sport in school? How does that relate to SDG 4 and access to quality education? For the first, Nianen. Okay, thank you once again. To, to answer the question, why is it important for refugee children to be given an opportunity to play? First, sports in school help children nurture their talents. That is, the hidden talents that they don't know, the hidden talents that they didn't discover themselves. So when they are uh, assisted, the teachers help them they will discover the talents that they never had or they never knew. A sport can help them develop their mental flexibility mm -hmm. and use creativity. When they come together, they participate, they give each other ideas, they develop mentally, they discover the creativity that they have. All together, they help themselves. Again, coming up with the, and realizing new ideas among themselves, like this person is capable of doing this, this person is talented in doing this, uh, participating in a certain sporting activities. Again, sport promotes inclusion and gender equality. Mm -hmm. That is boys and girls are allowed to play at the same time, the same game are, or in the same playground. Another one is that they are, they include themselves. Like if we are in the same team, I won't, uh, or they won't say that this is a girl. So she cannot play with us. They will develop or, yeah, they will develop the unite or the, the togetherness among them. That is the Ubuntu in, in another language. They'll be doing everything together regardless of the background, regardless of the ethnicity, regardless of the gender or regardless of the age that they have. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Keith? Okay, thank you again. 
for this opportunity. Uh, but uh, to answer the question why it is important, the youth and the sport, the youth and the primary schools teachers are now participants in the training course. And this training course will engage children in sport activities because what children will learn in use sport facilitator in school will the, 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 the children will go into the community and tell what they have learned in the school to their parents and the other children who are in the community who are not in that uh, team or who are in that uh, youth sport facilitator. So that one it will be like, uh, we trained one and the other one will go and train the other in the community. So th this training will go together with like, children who are in school or who are in sport, youth sport facilitator will go and train the other and they will go and train their families again how sport it is important. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how about Megumi? Uh, yes, thank you. And I think Nan and Kath um, outlined amazingly the positive impact of sport um, in education and maybe just talking a bit more on the technical side. So if we look at the SDG for the quality education and the targets, it really indeed contribute to targets 4.5 and 4.7. So ensuring equal access to education, mm -hmm. vocational training for the children in vulnerable situations, as well as promoting a culture of peace and nonviolence as, as well as gender equality. But I also wanted to highlight one more important aspect of the positive impact of sport, and this is the enrollment, also in retention in schools. So as Nanan and Keth explained, you know, sport activities have really increased student engagement, um, enjoyment in the schools, the connectedness that they experience in classrooms that really helps incentivize children to stay in primary school. Um, but also to bring in out of school children to be able to attend schools. And for example, a project uh, we supported in Iran, um, which was a project led by an Afghan female refugee. And you can see that, you know, among the diverse partners that we work with, we also work with refugees themselves mm -hmm. and refugee led organizations, but they use sport as an entryway to bring in girls who oftentimes do not have access to education because due to the cultural norms that I think um, Nanan was mentioning, how oftentimes communities see that, you know, girls don't have to be educated, they should rather stay home. But as the families start seeing the positive change that sport activities have on their children, um, they're more willing to let them go to school. And now this project is supporting about 400 children mm -hmm. per year, many of them out of school girls, I mean, really creating a pathway to education through inclusion in sport mm -hmm. activities. Thank you. And Andrew? Please. Well, to me, sport is, uh, is fundamental to education. Uh, often uh, let, underestimated, but uh, as I have said, I believe the sport is the most powerful tool of many things of citizenship, a promotion of health, but education as well. In, in sport, you understand your limits. In sport, you learn about values, how to, to play in a team. You know how to, you learn how to win, how to lose. So there are so many things that you learn through sport. You know, you know, the the let's say the reward of of hard training, of sacrifice. Uh, you you learn how to plan to get a, the performance that you want in a given competition. So I think it's just incredible. But uh, speaking on the SDGs on the equal access to sport, sport uh, to education. Sorry, education must be inclusive. And physical education must be inclusive as well. That's why we have one, pro one program called I Am Possible, where we, we teach teachers of elementary schools around the world in about, the, we, we teach the kids the values of Paralympic sport, but we also teach the teachers in how to involve the children with disabilities in the PE and the physical education classes. Because normally what happens in many countries is that kids with disability, they, they are dismissed. The teachers say, yeah, you don't need to practice sport. You, oh, you, can, you can't hurt yourself. But first of all, it's a right to practice sport. So you cannot deny a right to one of your students, to one of your kids. And the good way of bringing the kids together is that the kids with no disability, they learn 
how to interact and how to work with kids with disabilities. So it's good for everyone involved. It's only about being creative and having this inclusive attitude. So I couldn't be more supportive of sport as a very important tool for education and not only recreate at school. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Megumi, um, can you provide some good example of how the Paralympic movement has enhanced inclusion in communities? Can you answer? Uh, maybe I'll pass that to Andrew first, of course, because um, he's the global president of the IPC and the Paralympic <laughs> movement, if that's okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you provide some good example of how the Paralympic movement has enhanced uh, inclusion in communities? Uh, many, many examples. Uh, of course, the, what springs to mind is the example of the games. So, for example, in um, what we're trying to achieve in Japan, for example, is the change of mentality uh, in how society perceives persons with disability. Well, we have many examples. I can give you a, a, a one that is almost anecdotal. It's in the 1980 Games, the Olympic Games were held in Moscow, then Soviet Union. Uh, but at the time, the Paralympics were not held there because the, the Soviets saying there's no disabled person in this country. Can you imagine that? Of course, that was not the truth. To, uh, 34 years later, we had the Sochi Paralympic Games, Paralympic Winter Games. And in the lead up to Sochi in 2013, it, there was the, the first law on accessibility ever in Soviet Union or Russia was approved uh, as a direct legacy and consequence of Russia hosting the games then. The same happened in my country in Brazil with the first ever uh, law, not only on accessibility, but general on persons with disability being approved in 2015 uh, in the lead up to the real 2016 games. In, even in China, in the lead up to the Beijing Paralympics in 2008, in a country of more than 60 million persons with disability, the central government has invested more than the sum of all the previous 20 years in accessibility work. So there's a lot of legacy coming out of the games. What, but what we need to do now is the next step. It's how we can in between games promote inclusion through sport in different areas of the world, not only at the host games, host mm -hmm. city or host country of the games. Thank you very much. Uh, we do not have much time. So uh, for each of the panelists, starting with Mr. Parson, then to Kiss, then to Nyaneng, and then to Megumi. Please let the audience know one thing they can do to support the nearly 80 million people forced to flee around the world. Please answer in one minute. Okay, shorter than that, get involved. <laughs> get involved there are many refugee uh, camps around the world that you can support that you can financially or, or be a volunteer there's so many ways you can do it but getting involved understand uh, uh let's say how serious and how big is the issue around the world but getting involved if it's through sport through education it doesn't matter but it's a there's a big crisis around the world mm -hmm. sometimes may you see may 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 be perceived as invisible, but again, this, they are not numbers, they are human beings. So mm -hmm. if you can do something for 18 million people, you don't need to do it for 18 million people, but focus on what and contributing with your small part, get involved. Thank you. And Keith, one minute. Okay, okay. thank you again. Uh, for those people who are seeing us, uh, I'd like them to offer the training coaches, opportunity, opportunity for coaches and support them, their team, because they have their team and they don't have a, a sport equipment. So I would like them to support them for their team, for the like uh, sport equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nene? Thank you once again. Oh, my side for those who are uh, like watching us I, I would like like each one of you to offer refugees more opportunities when i say that more opportunities are let support them let them nurture their talents 
these opportunities can be in form of scholarship if they can be taken to better places, better schools, better academics where they can nurture their talents and they can also become a, a good participant in sporting activities. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. So I would say root for the refugees' dreams and share the dreams of refugees. So use your voices, your platforms to build awareness and show your support for people forced to flee. And I do have one concrete call to action. So on April 6th, so you might know it's the International Day of Sport for Development and Peace, and UNHCR will be launching a film um, that captures the power of sport for refugees. So please watch it. Share it on your social with your friends, with your community, and show your support for refugees running towards their dreams, as Pro mentioning. Thank you. Thank you. Five years ago, I encountered a judo practitioner who was a refugee, Popolu Misanga. He participated in the 2016 Rio Games as a part of the Olympic refugee team. When he was five or six, during the Congolese Civil War, he had to flee the ravaging fires and became apart from his family members, and he became a street child in the capital, Kinshasa. So he was sleeping on the street using cardboard boxes. And one day, by chance, he saw on TV a Japanese judo player, Inoue Kosei, and he won by Ippon. And he was mesmerized by that, and that image stayed in him. He watched that, and he wanted to become strong, and that's why he decided to start judo. Later, he became refugee athlete, and he participated in the Olympic Games. I met him, and when I was interviewing him, he was telling me stories about the time he was on the street, and he was crying, and I cannot forget his tears. I wonder what would have happened if he had not encountered judo. Sport has an incredible power that goes beyond our imagination. Refugees are displaced from their home countries and tend to lose their raison d'etre. Some people lose their goal of living and become addicted or depressed. However, by doing sports that move their bodies, on their own will, they can start to become independent and find hope for life. This concludes today's workshop. Thank you so much for your participation. Have a good day. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oyasumi nasai. Have a good day. Arigatou gozaimashita. Bye. Bye.